Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about Raynaud's or Raynaud's phenomenon, which is an exaggerated vascular response to cold temperature or emotional stress. It results in episodic abnormal vasospasm or vasoconstriction, causing a well demarcated color change in the skin of the digits, primarily the fingers or even the toes. Here is an example of a well demarcated discoloration involving multiple fingers of the hand. In Raynaud's phenomenon, vasospasm leads to a distinct triphasic color change in the affected area. Let's take a closer look at the mechanism of the color change. So under normal conditions, you have blood supply, arterioles supplying oxygen-rich blood to the digits, to the fingers. In Raynaud's phenomenon, you get vasoconstriction with vasospasm. This is typically exacerbated by cold temperature or even stress. This results in narrowing of the blood vessels in the fingers. The initial color change is white, also known as pallor, caused by reduced perfusion of blood to the area, causing the skin to blanch. The next color change is blue, also known as cyanosis. This occurs after some time due to the lack of oxygen being delivered to the area. Prolonged lack of oxygen leads to desaturation of hemoglobin in the affected area. The final color is red or erythema. Upon rewarming or resolution of the spasm, blood flow returns, causing a reactive hyperemia. The skin turns red. The blood vessels typically dilates. This is the triphasic response seen in Raynaud's phenomenon white, blue, and red. The fingers then eventually return to normal color again. As mentioned, Raynaud's phenomenon is often triggered by cold exposure or emotional stress. It can be a benign condition or associated with more severe underlying diseases, which leads us to the classification of Raynaud's phenomenon. There are two main types of classifications, primary Raynaud's phenomenon and secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. Primary Raynaud's phenomenon is also known as Raynaud's disease, and this is the most common. There is vasospasmodic attacks triggered by cold or stress. This is a benign form. It occurs in the absence of any other underlying disease and generally affects young people, often women, typically between the ages of 15 and 30. Secondary Raynaud's phenomenon is also known as Raynaud's syndrome. And this form is typically pathological and is associated with underlying diseases, most commonly autoimmune or connective tissue disease, such as systemic lupus erythematosus or systemic sclerosis. The onset of secondary Raynaud's phenomenon is typically middle to older adults. It can occur both in females and in men. However, being male of any age with Raynaud's should ring alarm bells for secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. The other difference between primary and secondary Raynaud's is that primary is usually bilateral, meaning affects both hands or feet, and often symmetrical in color change. Whereas secondary Raynaud's, the discoloration can occur in random fingers or digits, in any amount of digits. Secondary Raynaud's phenomenon is more severe and can be painful. Secondary Raynaud's phenomenon has a higher risk of complications such as ulceration of the digits, gangrene, or tissue loss. Here's an example of a hand with secondary Raynaud's phenomenon that has developed digital ulceration. Another key difference to differentiate primary to secondary Raynaud's phenomenon is by assessing the nail beds, looking at the nail bed capillaries, and this can be done using a capillaroscopy. In primary Raynaud's phenomenon, there is normal nail bed capillaries, whereas in secondary, it is abnormal. Let's take a look at what a normal nail fold capillary should look like. In this diagram, you can see that the capillaries at the base of the nail bed look like almost like hairpin loops. Then this is compared to a nail bed that is seen in secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. Here you can see dilated 
disorganized capillary loops with some associated dropouts, so dropout of the actual capillaries. And again, these changes are seen using a capillaroscopy by looking underneath the nail bed in someone who has Raynaud's phenomenon. The other difference between primary and secondary Raynaud's is that primary Raynaud's you have absent of antibodies such as anti-nuclear antibodies, ANA, or very low titers, whereas secondary Raynaud's you have positive ANA, relatively high titer greater than 160, or presence of another specific autoantibody such as anti-centromere antibody. So how do you treat Raynaud's phenomenon? Well, the management of Raynaud's phenomenon depends on the severity, frequency of episodes, and whether the condition is primary or secondary. First and foremost, lifestyle modifications. It's important to avoid any triggers. So patients should avoid cold exposure by wearing warm clothing, gloves, and keeping their body temperature quite stable. Stress management is also a very important key in reducing attacks. Smoking cessation. Nicotine is a potent vasoconstrictor. It's also important to avoid medications that can trigger vasoconstriction, such as decongestants, and certain beta blockers used in heart conditions can exacerbate Raynaud's phenomenon. Then you can use medications, pharmacological treatment. These include calcium channel blockers, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, prostacycline analogs, topical nitrates, as well as endothelin receptor antagonists which are typically used in uh, more severe cases and has been shown to reduce digital ulcer formation. Finally, it's important to treat any underlying conditions associated with Raynaud's phenomenon. This is typically, I'm talking about secondary causes or secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, which includes systemic lupus or systemic sclerosis. And so the use of immunosuppressive drugs may be used in this situation. So in conclusion, Raynaud's phenomenon, while common, can vary greatly in severity depending on whether it is primary or secondary. Primary Raynaud's is generally benign, whereas secondary Raynaud's may indicate serious underlying pathology and carries a risk of complications such as ulcers.